Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Global Mental Health Peer Network's first webinar of 2021. This year, we decided to kickstart our webinars on a very important topic, which is promoting men's mental health. And while, while it is such an overlooked topic, we felt that maybe because of that, we wanted to make it a special edition webinar, which for us meant that um, in the past, we used, we, we've selected individuals that are also outside of the Global Mental Health Peer Network to come in as international speakers, uh, experts by experience as well. But for this specific webinar, we thought of going within our own structure, ranging from uh, members in our board of management to our executive structure, our country representatives and staff alike. And this makes it just really a lot more special and um, a little bit more personal because this is our organization coming together to speak about a really important topic and we've selected both men and women to speak about this. So a warm welcome to everybody and a happy new year. I know we're just about in February, but better late than never. So let's, let's kickstart our um, webinar. If I could ask um, our, uh, our participants to please just briefly introduce themselves, name, surname, title, you know, what country are you from? Um, and then we'll move on to the actual structure of the webinar. So maybe we could start with um, Tivania because she is my co-host today. Um, and then we'll move on to the men who are the stars of our show today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Claude. Um, so I'm Tavanya Mudley. I'm an EXCO member of the Global Mental Health Peer Network, and I'm the South African representative. I'm also an author of a book called Girl on Fire. And one of my um, initiatives for last year and this year was to focus on men's health. I'm also a survivor of a failed suicide attempt. So mental health awareness is hugely important to me. And I think that this is something that we need to start um, having more engaging conversations about. I think men's mental health is really overlooked and we need to start changing the narrative. So my focus here is to start talking about redefining masculinity and starting the conversations that really matter. Fabulous, thank you. Thanks, Tiv. We are happy that you're on board and that your focus is exactly what we're talking about today. So I'm sure Bernard, Sean and Marcel will have a lot of information to share. Let's move on to Marcel, um, if you want to just give us a brief intro. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcel. I'm also a member of the EXO in South Africa. Um, I... Um, I think I'm going to make mine quite short and sweet because we've got a lot of talking to do. Um, and basically, I'm on this panel today because I am living with uh, a mood disorder. All right. And that's me, short and sweet. Cool. Thank you. And just to mention that he is part of our board of management. Um, so this is quite a big deal for us to have him here. So welcome, Marcel. Thank you. Cool. Um, Sean, next. Hi everybody, my name is Sean McNeil. I live in New Zealand, although I'm originally from Scotland, but I've been in New Zealand for the last 10 years. And I have lived experience of severe depression, anxiety, and I'm a suicide attempt survivor. And um, since my illness and my suicide attempts, um, I have worked for 25 years in mental health and suicide prevention and I'm looking forward to contributing to the discussions today it's a really worthy topic so thanks for organizing it Claudia. No problem at all thank you so much for accepting. Bernard next. Thanks Claudia really happy to be here. Uh, hi everyone my name is Bernard and I'm from uh, sunny Singapore so I'm the country representative uh, uh, for Singapore for Global Mental Health Peer Network. I'm also a co-founder for Kara Anmas, which is a community-based chat app that connects users uh, anonymously and securely with trained peer supporters and professional counsellors. I'm also a person in recovery um, and I have lived experiences with depression, 
anxiety and sleep disorder. And this is my third year of recovery. And uh, it took me six years before I sought help. So, um, you know, men's mental health, obviously, is a, is a big thing for me. And I'm happy to be here to share more. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So, Zaki, if I could just ask you um, from your technical side, if anybody's uh, got any messages directly from YouTube, if you'll just let us know if there's any questions for the, uh, for, for the participants, then we can just relay it through. Um, and anybody that's on this call, you're more than welcome to drop messages in the chat and we will try and, and, and stay up to date with that. Um, and there'll be questions and answers after each speaker as well. So there'll be ample time for that. Okay, so thank you guys. Thanks so much for um, agreeing to join us today for this. So I think our main message across all of what we're trying to say today is that we can't just go around saying, just man up, you know, put yourself towards yourself, um, you know, don't be such a girl about it. So there's a lot of things that we want to change. There's a lot of terminology and language that also goes with it that needs to change. And perhaps, Sean, I know you've mentioned this before, you could just kind of throw it in later in, in um, the conversation. Um, but the objective of this webinar is really that our audience, as well as our participants, learn from each other, get information, share stories, um, and really create that awareness about pro or promotion of um, men's mental health. And so if we could start and get things going, can I ask Marcel, if you could start by sharing your story with us and how it affected you and how did it affect um, the people around you and how did they react to your story? So if we can start with yours, that would be great. Okay, thanks, Claudia. Um, it's a long one. Uh, <laughs> I think for many of us, it's a long one. Um, and I think only with time did I realize how long my story is. Um, I think all the way back from, from the age of six, my mother was already concerned that, that her son wasn't acting uh, a normal in that um, he preferred to spend time alone rather than with other people. And by the age of nine, I was already concerned about... Uh, the, the ozone hole and, and how we're all going to sort of be vaporized and die and um, if we don't sort of seal this hole. And my mother thought, no, that's not what a nine-year-old is supposed to be worrying about. Um, mm. Always so sort of sad and always concerned about all sorts of things like this. She thought, nine-year-old's supposed to be happy, running around. But it was always a case of, oh, he'll grow out of it. Maybe it's just watching too much TV. Um, so we'll limit the amount of TV and watching these documentaries. Um, and it carried on as such. In, in, in my teenage years, it, I was, I could say, never a, a happy teenager. Um, I always felt something was missing. Um, and I could never put my, my finger on it. There was just, um, I, I tried to accumulate interests, but none of my interests really ever made me happy. Um, so there was always the striving for happiness. And I think um, even with time, I've, I've realized that happiness, it's how you define it. Um, I think it's, very, it's a very unique idea, um, what we define as happiness. And I think one of the most important things, I think it's actually an advantage for, for many people which uh, you know, live with mood disorders, is that they, they've come to understand um, almost the, the illusion of happiness. Um, so taking it from there, I can say that my first real realization um, or my first real sort of, how do I put it, slap in the face of my mood disorder was in my early 20s. Um, and I had to be... Um, admitted into an institution for it because I essentially became non-functional. Um, and before I was admitted, I was basically, um, I think the scariest thing for me was not knowing what was going, what was going on. Um, for lack of having another, uh, another term, I'm going to use the term that I felt all the way back then, was I thought my brain was just going crazy. Everything was going wrong. Um, and 
I could not talk to my family about it. And I think the most important thing that I need to bring from there is my upbringing. Now, my upbringing, my father comes from a tiny, and my mother as well, from a tiny little village in Portugal, where when he left that village, there were 15,000 people living there. That's it. And everybody knew everybody's business. I mean, you could ask anybody about anybody else's business and they knew everything. So, and that village was, ex was, was very conservative. So anything sort of mental was, was, was not so a broken leg is, is understandable, but sort of um, anything like uh, sort of anxiety, depression, anything like that, that, that wasn't seen as a real thing. It was seen as something that you go and lay down and um, have a cup of tea and tomorrow you'll be fine. And if not, then it's sort of your own fault because you're not making an effort. Um, so more or less to this day, which is 25 years later, my father still doesn't understand uh, my mood disorder. And um, for most of that time, um, when he had to pay for my psychiatrist, he believed he was paying, and that's what he told himself, he was paying for my neurobiologist because that's a real doctor. So that was okay for him. Um, and that's how it had to continue. And through more than one time that I had to be institutionalized, um, he would come visit me. There would be no discussion about why I was in there, uh, the type of people that were in there. Um, it would be a sort of quick in out, um, so there was no, there was no discussion. It's just, you're not well. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, so there was no sympathy there. There was no support there. And my support had to come from, from friends. And so very quickly, what I discovered was that um, support from family was translated into support from friends. My friends essentially substituted my family for support. Um, and to this day, that, that, that's a huge divide because it makes you feel as if there's a certain connection with, for example, my father that I will never have. Um, mm. A certain part of my life that will always be absent. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And I think that's so important because you kind of kept that in for so long and you had no further support other than your friends and and. Your friends can help, but it's it's a different kind of support. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I come from a Portuguese family myself, and I completely understand what you're saying. And it's I think culture plays a huge role in this. Um, and I'm sure Sylvania might touch on this a little bit later. But thank you, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I don't know if there's anybody that wants to ask him Marcel a question, panelists or any attendees. I think that is. Come in quickly about how oh. shame, shame has actually become an industry in and of itself. And yeah. interesting to note that the things that I felt um, growing up, Marcel is, is articulating about, you know, just not being understood. And I thought it was, you know, predominantly in the Indian community, but it's interesting how it permeates into, you know, all communities, mm -hmm. uh, just about carrying that load of shame, which actually just uh, compounds depression. That certainly was the case for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and I think oh, this was this falls quite nicely into what I was going to talk about next, um, which is sort of more of the the stats, the statistics. You know, where it says, um, you know, mental health doesn't discriminate on gender or race, age, um, and this is proof because while Marcel is now shared his story. You've also just said that you also came through. You also went through something similar. So it's both men and women that go through these things. But I think it's the way in which men um, and our panelists are here disagree or don't or agree. Uh, but it's the way in which we handle stuff, or in the way in which we also um, like our childhood and how we were brought up that makes a difference how we react. And um, with the statistics that we've got, I mean, while mental health doesn't discriminate it seems to be that men um, are more prone to using substance abuse as a form of sort of you know feeling better versus going 
to talk about it with somebody. Um, and also they would then be more prone to death by suicides, which is the statistics show it's, it's more with men um, than women. But at the same time, both men and women feel the same struggles and go through the same challenges. It's just how, you know, it's interesting to see and determine why it has to be like that for men and why is it okay for women to talk about it but not not men. So, Sean, I see, is that your hand up? Are you asking teacher a question? That's my hand up, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. it's, it's also about the social cultural expectations on men. Men are culturally supposed to be the strong, stoic uh, providers. You know, that's, that's how we are brought up and that's all the messages that we receive, that we are supposed to be the strong ones that provide for others. And therefore, when you, when you feel that you are unable to meet that social cultural expectation, then it has a big impact on your sense of yourself. And, and so that's, it, it's not just about how we cope with the distress when there is distress around. It's also about the social cultural expectations on us as men. Sure, fair enough. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Bernard, do, would you like to add in anything? Or do you want to touch that, touch on that later? Up to you. Yeah, uh, I just want to add. Um, you know, because of how society perceives men, um, men grew up on a different set of values. That we need to be strong breadwinner. We cannot show a fragile side of us. You know, on one hand, I think we need to change uh, those societal perceptions and pressures that mm -hmm. it's okay for men to identify and share how they feel. Uh, without feeling weak or less manly. Um, I think there's a lot of things we can do and a lot of channels where men can easily access um, and share when they're struggling. And I think one of those things uh, could be through things like journaling, for example. Uh, when you're not able to express yourself directly, I think journaling is really a great way for men to write down and reflect how they feel. Um, digital platforms are there as well for men to you know, express themselves if they want to. So mm. these are just some of the examples where men can um, you know, be unafraid to express themselves and their struggles. Okay, Thank you. fair enough. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's um, just want to make sure that we don't have any comments or anything in here. Okay, I think that's okay. Um, all right, so let's let's move on to. I think Marcel see. wants to say something. Oh, did Marcel want to? See? Sorry, I might have missed that. Marcel, do you want to go? A very quick thing to, that I just oh. wanted to say quickly in response to Bernard. Um, I think, for example, I, I picked it up when you mentioned journaling, and I'll tell you why. Um, I have gone through numerous psychiatrists, psychologists, institutions. So I've very often heard journal, um, gratitude lists, things like that. And I've started numerous and I've thrown away numerous. And you bring up an interesting point and I'll tell you why. Because of my upbringing, I've constantly got this little voice in the back of my head, which tells me that writing down my problems, with, uh, journaling, okay, is not something that a man should do in order to deal with his issues. So I understand that we're trying to say, that you're trying to say that, well, one way to, that, that's one of the issues, um, is that we don't know how to deal with it. But I think something that's also very important as far as a men's mental health is concerned, and I think that's a huge challenge, is instead of trying to impose a certain sort of um, ideology of mental health treatment across the board, it's rather trying to see what type of interventions fit with a certain society. I mean, um, I think it's, it's seen across the board that when you take a sort of Western mode of treatment and, or, or ideal and, and you try and impose that on an Eastern society, it doesn't work because it's a completely foreign concept. Um, things like, um, I'm thinking off the cuff of 
psychologists coming from the United States uh, to deal with um, uh, survivors of the Rwandan genocide, uh, the psychologists were all asked, asked to leave because the idea of one-on-one um, -on -one talking in a room was completely foreign to the to, in those villages. As far as they were concerned, um, helping somebody feel better mentally was a group activity outside in nature. So the psychologists were all very kindly thanked for their time and asked to please go home because they thought they were just making matters worse. So um, I just want to bring that up. Um, and uh, you sparked my mind when you said journaling because many psychologists have tried to get me to journal and it's usually gotten to about day five and then no, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. So I've had to find other ways. And to be honest with you, I have found other ways. Um, like for example, I became a stained glass artisan. And I found when I'm doing stained glass, that helps me process. Because if I'm not concentrating on it, I cut my finger. Um, so I think, you know, it has to fall into our, our culture. I think that's very, very important. Like Claudia even mentioned and Tavania mentioned, culture really and society is very important. I think we always have to keep in mind the effects that it's having. We, we can never keep the two separate. Look, if, if journaling works for a person, then it works. If it doesn't, then we can't force it on them. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> It does. Um, thanks, Marcel. And I think that's something that goes more towards recovery and finding what works for you and not being, you know, and not for others. Um, but it's a valid point that I think we need to look within society, within our own cultural sort of setup. Um, but, you know, that's also something that within the mental health context from a broader perspective, you know, what are the other supportive uh, techniques or holistic Sort of practices you can put in place that can help you um, but valid points i think it's it's different for everybody but um if journaling works and your your artistic other stuff works then that's also good nice to know that there is different options though um so thanks bernard for sparking interest into Marcel's little story there um so if we can move on um sean so if we can go to you now um if you, I know you briefly explained earlier a little bit about your lived experience, um, but I don't know if you want to just um, hash it out slightly more and, and give us just a little bit more of, um, of, of your background. Sure, it'd be a pleasure to. Um, just a note before I start that I'm going to be talking about um, suicide, and so I know that's a sensitive subject, but um, given the um, the topic of the um, webinar yeah. today um, is obviously something that we were going to cover. Um, so I've made two attempts on my life um, that were quite diff different. And so interesting in that perspective that they were really quite different. The first one um, was in the late 1990s. Um, I was in my mid-30s, married with two children, with a mortgage and a car and a steady job and everything else. So on the face of it, things were going okay. And I was driving to work one morning and I decided that I was going to drive my car into a motorway bridge. And so I did that, um, but I failed miserably. <laughs> and so obviously when that happens you can feel even more of a failure because you can't even do what you're intending to do. But that really scared me because such an overwhelming and dangerous feeling that I acted upon that came on me so quickly with no real um, warnings for myself, never mind warnings for everybody else that might have cared for me. And so I uh, broke down on that day and presented myself at hospital and was admitted to, for the first time to the psychiatric ward. Um, now, this is interesting at the time because um, I was working as a mental health nurse in the psychiatric ward. So, um, so obviously, that was a bit uh, delicate. And what happened ultimately was I was moved to a different hospital so that I wasn't receiving services in the same place as I worked, etc. So 
So I was diagnosed with severe depression at the time and um, was on constant observations. And eventually, after a lot of nursing um, psychology input, a, psycholo- a psychiatrist prescribing me medications and a course of electroconvulsive therapy, I began to start to function again. And after a few uh, months was well enough to come out of the hospital. The second um, suicide attempt was five years later when my depression had returned quite badly and my marriage failed. um, I decided that I should leave the marital home and my teenage children. My illness was affecting my performance at work and therefore I lost my job as well. So you can imagine in terms of precipitance, I had lost my relationship, I'd lost connection with my children, I lost my job, Um, I subsequently went bankrupt, and for a short period of time I was homeless as well. And so there were all those precipitants um, prior to me making an attempt on my life at that time. Um, And at that time I lived on my own, so I was pretty confident that if I made an attempt on my life it was going to be successful. Um, However, unexpectedly a friend phoned me just before I slipped into a coma and um, realised something was seriously wrong and phoned an ambulance. And so um, that ambulance took me to hospital. And the next few months were really difficult. Um, I really felt as if I was worthless and didn't have a place, didn't have any value to my children from an employment point of view. It was really the kind of lowest point in my life Um, I even spent 24 hours in a police cell. And you know those times in your life where you think, well, life can't get any more shit than it is right now. That was kind of one of those times. Mm -hmm. However, I eventually regained my feeling of value through getting into doing some voluntary work. And that helped to build up my confidence, which eventually led to me being employed as a Um, mental health manager in a community organization similar to the one that um, Bernard was talking about, kind of peer-run organization. And that getting used to that concept that the fact that I'd had a lived experience could actually add a tool to my toolbox rather than being something negative. Eventually, I became the managing director of a mental health advocacy organization Um, And I got opportunities to speak on radio and television and even in the country's parliament about my lived experience and my recovery. It was an exciting time to be involved in mental health. And um, one of the things that I was involved in was co-founding a national um, peer consumer organisation for people with lived experience and also getting involved in the parliament uh, just when they were creating some new mental health legislation. So really having an opportunity to put a voice of lived experience from a collective perspective and funnel that into those kind of um, decisions that are about policy and legislation within the country. And now um, I uh, have moved country and I live in New Zealand and I work for the government in New Zealand. And my job is to ensure that the voices of people with lived experience across the country are involved in improving the safety and the quality of mental health and addiction services so that they are really meeting the needs that we have as much as uh, possible. And I'm remarried and live in a lovely house in the countryside. So my life went from good to really awful and now has got to great again. So it's a little bit of a a journey um, and through some really worrying and tragic times and some real times of severe illness, but out the other side and a whole lot of new opportunities opening to me. Wow, um, that that story is scary and inspiring, you know, um, that you had to go through all of that. And um, I'm sure your family and us here, well, I'm happy that you're around still. So thank you for fighting and being here to tell your story. Um, it, it's, it's incredible.
incredible what you went through. And um, it's, yeah, your story is just, I'm even dumbfounded. And for me to not be able to speak is, <laughs> it's something. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Um, I see that we've got a message quick just in our chat. So I just want to have a look if it's relevant to um, anything we've said. Um, okay, so there's a message, and I think this is going back to our talk about uh, language and, and community and culture. So this comes from Facebook, um, where it says the model for Africa should be very different, i.e. community-based, and even language and tradition differs from the West. Educates our aunts and our grandparents. Um, so I think that goes back to what Marcel maybe was saying. Sorry, Sean, to just, I just wanted to make sure we don't miss that. And even what you were saying, that culturally and Bernard, that, you know, we men are required to be strong and not show emotion and things like that. So thank you for the comment. It's well noted. Um, all right. So, Bernard, um, sorry, uh, Sean, let's go to your next question um, that I've got for you. So, you know how we get there's posters and flyers and things on social media that shows us, um, not even on social media, you can go to the doctor's offices and there's always pamphlets of the signs and the symptoms of, you know, what depression could look like. Um, so you don't want to wake up in the morning, you have a loss of appetite, or maybe you're eating too much, there's no interest in what you used to be interested in. Um, now for you, from your lived experience, at what point did you realize that you know, you were in this dark hole and perhaps trying out, you know, not being able to live anymore is probably the best way out. At what point did you realize that that was your, I don't know how to put it, but like, at what point did you come to the realization that this was the moment? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that um, I see it as a kind of spiraling down and, and what you do is that you you almost look for things that confirm your pattern of thinking. So, you know, somebody walks past you in the street that you know, but they don't acknowledge you and you think, yeah, that's because I'm worthless. I knew I was worthless and they've just confirmed that I'm worthless. So it's those kind of things that help feed the ideas that you have in your head that, that fuel that spiraling downwards and downwards into the into the darker places, you know. And yeah, there is a, you know, there is an element of losing interest and pleasure in the things that you normally enjoy, yeah. um, feeling distressed, feeling unmotivated, and um, feeling quite numb and cold inside. And very interestingly, most of the time when I was on antidepressants, I still felt quite numb and cold inside. Antidepressants, helped me a little bit but also made me feel as if I had no emotions at all you know as if I was almost uh mm -hmm. you know I don't know a robot or something you know that I couldn't feel joy I couldn't feel happiness but I couldn't feel down or I couldn't feel excitement or anything you know it just made me feel really really numb and so it wasn't a particular pre pleasant experience although I, I think it was something that probably contributed to my recovery and the other thing is about not caring about others, you know, because people obviously said to me, you know, you've got two beautiful daughters, uh, you know, how could you think about ending your life when you've got two beautiful daughters? But you just get so caught up in the thoughts that actually they would be better off without me. I'm just a burden on them because they worry about me and, and you know, my my teenage daughter shouldn't be in a place where they have to worry about me. And so it just gets wrapped up into your your negative spiral thinking and um, you know you um, you can cut yourself off and isolate yourself and therefore nobody's challenging that spiraling down so um, yeah it can be can be really challenging so that's kind of how I knew that there was a difference between feeling a bit low and actually feeling um, uh, depressed you know as Marcel said you know it's about not functioning when you come to a place where you're no longer functioning and the your your symptoms are impacting your day-to-day -day life then it's time to say I, I need some help and reach out if you can uh, reach out to try and get some help and support great 
And um, yeah, so thank you. I, I mean, my last question to you was going to be, what would you say to somebody, you know, who's feeling that bad? But I think you've kind of somewhat added in there, like seek help and be aware of what you're feeling. Um, and, you know, I guess yeah. if you don't know what you're feeling, ask for help. Um, so they're, they're obviously in New Zealand, um, the Maori people are the, the um, indigenous people of New Zealand. And they have a saying which is talking is the healing of the mind and spirit. So if you can talk, if you can communicate to somebody, then it is a really healing thing to do. It's, a, it's you know, our, our primal way of connecting between one human being and another. But obviously, as we've already said, there are times where you maybe can't talk or you don't have the words to express um, how you're feeling. And so you can think about either writing it down or expressing yourself in art or, or communicating in some other way to try to express your feelings. And suicidal feelings are really common. So people shouldn't feel that they are alone if they have suicidal feelings. Many, many people have thought about ending their lives, but have found a way through that, you know, so... People can definitely have suicidal thoughts, but still um, find a way through because often we, we don't actually want our lives to end. What we want is the, the pain or the suffering or the trauma to end. And so while it feels like at the time there is no other option but life ending, there are ways to, to, um, to get through those feelings even though they might be quite overwhelming or, or terrifying at the time and it's hard to know what to do but people can get through it great thank you I think that's so important um, that's an important message and I hope that um, maybe we could make um, you could just get us a little post with that saying from your indigenous people and maybe it's something we can share you know, on a post after this um, session, I think it's it's really important and so nicely put. So if you don't mind perhaps sharing that with us and we can also sort of share it on our socials. Um, thank you, Sean, thanks so much. Um, Tiv, do you wanna add anything else to this or can I move on? Um, I just wanna to say to Sean, it's so uncanny that our stories are so similar um, and uh, it just speaks again about resonance and how when you start talking about these important things, you can identify with so many people around you. You think you're alone in the situation, but now when you talk about it, um, it's unbelievable to me how much in sync we are. Um, my story is very similar. I also had two kids and I was filled with shame at the thought of leaving them, but you know that utter despair leaves no option. Um, and coincidentally, um, when I tried to kill myself, it was also driving my car straight off of a bridge. So I think we are more connected than we give ourselves credit for. And I think these conversations are just testament to that um, and how important it is. But I think the fundamental thing is that we all yearning to be seen. That was a huge thing for me. I, didn't, I don't know if I would have wanted to kill myself if I actually was just seen without judgment or shame. And I think we can all relate to that. So thank you very much. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so Bernard, um, we're on to you now. Um, well, maybe, I don't know if we want to talk about the... the um, sorry? Marcel, Marcel, Marcel oh, wants to jump why in. Why can I never see Marcel's hand? This is <laughs> ridiculous. Sorry, Marcel, go ahead. Not a problem. It's just two quick things I want to to mm. uh, comment on that that Sean said. Uh, the first thing he said, the, the word he mentioned was spiraling, um, and uh, I can completely relate to that. Uh, I was was once told, and and, and I completely uh, oh I, I understood that was being told that when I'm spiraling, the worst place I can be is in my head. Uh, my head was the worst place to to be sitting in, um, and as Sean described, it's it's this constant reinforcing of everything you need to keep spiraling. Um, and I think even to today, uh, one of the um, things I struggle with is when uh, my my mood disorder gets 
takes you to that place where the spiral starts accelerating and it's how to stop it. It's still a struggle for me. I think that's one of my, 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 my struggles that has always been enduring is once it gets going, um, how to stop it. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. Um, second thing I just wanted to comment on was, uh, Sean also mentioned things that he wants to hear and things that he doesn't want to hear, uh, things that help him. And I think one of the things that helped me the most has always been for people not to say to me that they understand what I'm going through. Um, I always found that to be one of the most patronizing things. Um, and the best thing that was ever said to me by, was by my partner who, um, when I was going through a, a next episode, who said to me, I have no idea what you're going through and I will never understand what this is, but I'm always here for you. Uh, mm. That was the best. Um, I think that was the best. Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. And that means more than saying, I don't, like, that means more than saying, I understand what you're going through because it's, it's not true, right? Um, and again, going back to family and support and partners that can help. Um, you don't have to, I think there's that misconception where you have to understand what somebody's going through in order to help them, but that's not necessarily true. Rather be a support system to me when I'm going through whatever it is I'm going through, and I will tell you how I'm feeling so that you can just get a broader sort of not, not understanding, but just an idea of what's happening. And almost it, it will almost um, explain why you're behaving the way you're behaving um, or why you're doing what you're doing. And so thank you. That's a valid point. Um, so Bernard, let's, let's move on to you. Before we go back to Tavonia to talk about masculinity and depression and the linkage, um, I know last year you did, towards the end of the year, you did a lot of a lot of talks and discussions on promoting men's mental health. And um, you, you, I think towards the end of the year, you did that really nice big webinar. Could you maybe just share with us what was the, what are the common themes that, you know, keeps coming up that you find or other the barriers or what's working in the, what's an advantage or what can we do? Um, if you could just, possibly give us an idea of what are the themes that you've seen? Sure, Claudia. Um, I guess first and foremost, men ask for help differently, right? Um, I think men are more likely to accept help if there's a chance for reciprocity. Uh, that means <laughs> that when they perceive an opportunity to help the other person in return, um, I think they may actually reach out for help. Um, much easier, right? So that's one of those things that came, that came up, um, you know, during the webinar for men's health uh, last year. And mm -hmm. I think uh, the other thing we, we spoke about during these webinars is how can we reframe, um, you know, the issues men's, men are ex, you know, experiencing in, men's, in mental health. Uh, for example, I think there's a lot of uh, discussion on how it's very solution driven. So if we reframe it in such a way that um, we can think about it as just another problem to fix, for example, um, like another car part to replace, you know, a wall to patch up, things like that. I think it might be a little bit easier to get across in a sense. Um, and of course, I think the other things that we spoke about, uh, and I think it kept coming up, kept coming up was, um, campaigns and awareness are not quite targeted to men. Um, mm. You know, there's a lot of research to indicate that men can actually re respond quite strongly to humor, right? Um, you know, and also, and at least initially to softer mental health language. So I think it's a little bit lacking there. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context and example, um, I, I used to struggle with uh, an eating disorder, right? And uh, when I spoke about it in my youth to people, um, they would not believe it. You know, in their minds, they would be having this perception that, you know, eating disorder, bulimia, etc. It belongs to the female space. Mm -hmm. Why would you, as a guy, have that kind of problems, right? So I struggled with it for a long time. Um, I'm okay now, thankfully. Um, but after that, you know, came the 
big wave of depression, etc. So I think uh, those are those are the kind of things that we do struggle as as male, um, in that sense. Okay, well that yeah that's really yeah. interesting, and I think um, what I would essentially love um, to do is perhaps for us to all regroup again after this and think about a campaign or something that we could do specific to this kind of uh, to this topic and. Like you said, um, what's the best way to reach? And, and perhaps it's through humor. So what can we do that brings bring men together as well as women, so that we can also understand, you know, what's what's the barrier for men? And you know, if this group could just come together again and perhaps think about something that we can, as the peer network, help, you know, um, bring to the table in terms of men's mental health and what what you've seen works and what doesn't work and think about it and focus it primarily for men, uh, what language to use, what are the coping mechanisms you found to be, to work and what doesn't work. And also um, sharing of stories seems to be very important because like you say, an eating disorder is often associated with women, you know, and we want to look amazing in the bikini in December kind of a thing when we're going to the beaches and, you know, so it goes to women, but it's interesting um, to see that that's not really the case. So it's very important that we bring these kinds of things up and more often as well. So I'd be very interested to see what this group, if you're all keen to carry on this conversation as well after um, this webinar. Um, all right, and then just before I go into your next question, Bernard, I think if Tavania can just touch on the masculinity and the linkage to depression. Uh, so I think Bernard said something that was uh, really profound, which is that men need to be able to reach out to other men. And what I found interesting is that men would rather die literally than tell another man that he's suffering. So we need to start changing the programming that we have in our head um, and this idea about masculinity because I think it's something that we learned. It's, it's a conditioned way of thinking. It's not something that's inherent in us. Um, and, you know, we need to start to normalize emotional discourse among men. Um, and to start changing this bro code language that we have. Um, so where vulnerability is seen as a weakness, it needs to be an expression of uh, courage and strength because that's effectively what it is. Um, so I think that, you know, there's nuanced conversations um, that are so fluent in um, emotional self-censorship. So we don't speak the truth, basically. And I think that we need to start doing that more and more. And in that way, we can connect with each other in such profound ways that um, can, can lead to healing. So I've often said that uh, truth is a bridge. And in that bridge, you can connect two points and you can meet in the middle. And that is where real restoration can take place. But it starts with having these important conversations about you know, how we perceive men to be. And we need to start changing that narrative. It's incredibly important. And it begins with men. It begins with men being comfortable enough to say to the to you know, it can start at home. It can start with um, uh, the wife or the partner or whomever to say, you know, I'm really struggling. I'm not coping with this or I'm really sad or I'm overwhelmed. And as women, we've got an obligation to make it a safe space for our men to have those conversations and to change this ideology that we have about men coming in on their white horses and saving us. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure. It puts a lot of pressure on men to conform to this ideal and to not, um, you know, be um, true to themselves. And I think that's such an important conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Bernard, jumping on, on that, right? what do you, and also based on, again, those workshops and webinars you did last year, what would, in your opinion, what would be the best way for us to go forward um, from a mental health advocacy platform, um, which obviously the peer network can also assist with Cara and Mask or with even Sean's networks and Marcel's networks. Um, what can we do to help break this, this stigma? And like Tavania said, is how do we get across that bridge so that we can all be on the same. It's, it's obviously not going to happen overnight, but what, in your opinion, can we do? Because I would really love for this to be something that we work on this year quite strongly. And it doesn't mean we're going to change everything, but it means we can start somewhere. 
Yeah, Claudia, I think uh, we are in a really good place to start off because we are global peer network support, right? And uh, I think uh, for men to start a first conversation about their mental health, there's no better place than talking about it with your peers. The reason why I say that is um, if we as men were to reach out for uh, professional counseling help, um, there's a certain perception from society that yes, you know, we are weak, we need help, etc. right? But if we sit down with our mates on a Friday evening, have a beer, just have a casual chat, you know, as a peer supporter kind of role, I think it, it helps a lot, right? Um, and that was really when I started my recovery from peer support, you know? Um, of course, I'm not saying that professional counselling doesn't help, it does, but for me... Um, you know, I was not attending my counseling sessions and having peer support, having my male friends coming in to just urge me on, guide me, handhold me from session to session. It helps so much, you know. So I yeah. think um, our organization can play such a big part in uh, improving men's health, in raising uh, awareness about men's health. We're in a good place, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's that's... That's where we can start. Okay, so at the peer support level, and I, um, I mean, I know you've shared your story with me before, and um, that was the reason you you went into peer support work in the first place, right? It was from your experience when you were hospitalized, and I don't know if maybe you want to just touch on that briefly and explain the power of that peer support, um, so that it can filter through nicely into what we're trying to do here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've had a lot of hospital stays. <laughs> Um, and I had countless professional counseling sessions. Um, I've attempted my life uh, five times. Um, not succeeded. I'm still here. Um, and I think all of yeah. it, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's good. Um, all of it uh, was quite a journey for me. And um, what really prompted my recovery was uh, a few factors, obviously. You know, it was... It was um, getting that really one good counsellor uh, along with a couple of uh, peer supporters as my pillar of support. So uh, that really got me to turn around and start to, to uh, embark on my recovery path. Um, so that got me thinking, you know, um, there's a lot of, a lot of um, technology platforms out there that acts as a market space where they met you with uh, you know a counselor they want to do the transaction fast they want to clock in that that uh, transaction fee etc so I thought hey you know that's not the way we should be looking at uh, looking at things so I started to think you know could we possibly uh, engage the help of peer supporters because it's it's such a viable option besides counseling right so um, that was where I started to build Kara Anmas. And it so happened that in Singapore and in Asia, especially peer support is still uh, considered quite a foreign concept. So uh, we are picking that up uh, and it just kind of falling nicely with what we're building at Kara Anmas. We're seeing a lot of traction, a lot of people who want to volunteer, but of course we are really careful because uh, we need them to be trained in a certain capacity uh, uh, to handle mental sure. health conversations. You know, so that's what we've been trying to do. Yeah. Okay. Um. Would you mind just dropping in the chat there your uh, the website or the link to Kara and Mask so that everyone else can also just have a look at that. Um, sure. Yeah, I think this has been a great conversation. Um, Sean, Marcel, is there anything else you want to add on to the peer support? Because I know um, in South Africa and that kind of also goes through Africa, peer support is still quite unknown, um, whereas there, there is peer support groups, but it's not really a peer support worker. Um, so, you know, we, that's something that the peer network is also working on at the moment, which is going to be something big, hopefully, which will ease the platform for this. Um, but if you guys want to add, Sean, hand up with the teacher again. You can put your hand down. You can go. <laughs> so, um one of the peers that has inspired me most in my recovery journey is a man called Daniel Fisher. And I met Daniel Fisher about 20 years ago 
And Daniel Fisher is actually a psychiatrist from Boston in the USA, but he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and institutionalized before he did his psychiatric training. And he, he was determined when he was in the psych ward that he was going to come out of the psych ward, trained to be a psychiatrist and be a much more compassionate psychiatrist than, mm -hmm. than he had experienced in his own treatment. And Daniels founded a training called Emotional CPR. And it's, okay. it's, it's based on the fact that um, we are not conversant in being emotional with each other. And therefore, we actually need to learn it just like you learn cardiopulmonary resuscitation to help somebody if they've had a mm -hmm. heart attack. Then you learn a way of emotionally connecting with people. Um, and it's particularly effective um, for men because, as we have talked about, men are so poor at connecting with each other emotionally. So um, Dan's um, in his late 70s now and is uh, he's, he's definitely not as uh, youthful as he used to be. But, um, uh, it, it's just a, he's just a really inspiring person, somebody that can... Um, carry out the profession of psychiatry but use a lived experience lens and um, really gets it in terms of what's needed to try to help community to become a more a place where uh, everybody's mental well-being is better looked after. Yeah. All right, that's a valid point and um, we're looking to do a webinar I'll get back to you now, Marcel. <laughs> uh, we're looking to do a webinar next month. And if it's not going to be next month, it will be March. And it's going to be about us versus them, which is the idea of psychiatrists and psychologists and counsellors um, who also have lived experience with mental health and how they are not ready to share within their own professional sphere or domain with the other professionals that they do actually have a lived experience or they're living with depression or anxiety, but actually that there's another side to it because they can be more relatable to their patients and their clients and they can be, um, they can understand a bit better. And I can take that, um, I can say that personally because, I mean, with my lived experience, that's the reason I became a counsellor in the first place before I became a before I really got into mental health advocacy. So I completely relate. And I think if we could have perhaps Daniel Fisher, um, if you could perhaps get us all in contact maybe and have him speak about his, if he wants to, or perhaps you could do it on his behalf. Or, But I think that's an important conversation that really drives what we're trying to do here is peer support. Um, we don't have to go straight into counseling and psychotherapies. And we can start with talking to each other. You know, starting over here will always kind of build the resilience and the strength to get us into better places. So thanks, Sean. That was really, um, that's that's noted. And if we could maybe chat about that after, maybe next week sometime, that would be great. Marcel, um, you Thank can go now. You. This, sure. is a, this is a quick question. Um, and I'm actually sending it out to Sean Bernard and Tavania. Um, it was inspired by Sean, though. <laughs> is there, have they noticed a difference in peer support between men and women with respect to numbers? In other words, are men getting peer support from one other male friend, women getting peer support from a group of female friends? Are you, are you finding that at all? Anyone want to go first? <laughs> Interestingly, um, a large part of my audience or the people that I deal with or that contact me or who've read my book are men. And I, that is very interesting to me because I would have thought that they wouldn't find any synergy um, just because my story is so much about what women uh, deal with um, and what contributed to my depression for such a long time. But um, I think one of the most um, impactful things that happened to me last year was a black gentleman read my book and he said to me that I stopped him from committing suicide. 
So that for me was absolutely huge. And it's a very interesting, um, I don't want to say discrepancy, but you know, uh, you would think it's, it deviates from, from the norm about um, how uh, men resonate uh, with women. So I don't know if it was the fact that I'm openly vulnerable and I share my story so candidly that gives uh, men permission to reach out to me, or it's the fact that I'm such a, you know, I'm so huge on talking about uh, the importance of men's health. But I find that most of the people that I, that come to me as a peer are predominantly men. Interesting. Sure. So to answer Marcel's question, um, generally speaking, groups of women talk about their emotions. Groups of men talk about sport. <laughs> so um, yeah. women are really a culturally much more to sharing their emotions and therefore in a peer support uh, circumstance, um, most of the peer organizations that I'm connected with, the... Um, the gender split is probably about 60% females using the service and 40% males. Um, and obviously there are some um, transgendered LGBTQI um, people, etc. cetera. But, um, but certainly the most common relationship in terms of peer support and the most common attenders of groups in peer support, um, the majority are women. And that's part of the dilemma that we have, isn't it? You know, so from going back to suicide, men account for three quarters of the deaths of, by suicide in um, many countries, but um, but uh, aren't taking up opportunities for peer support, etc. And this is just a really good opportunity for me to make a point about terminology or la and language as well that Claudia alluded to earlier on. Mm -hmm. So. In the, in the community, we don't use the term commit suicide anymore. The reason that we don't use that term is because what are other things that you commit? You commit murder, you commit rape, and suicide yeah. in most countries is no longer a crime. And the International Association for Suicide Prevention have got a campaign at the moment to decriminalize suicide where it is a crime. You know, commit has a real negative connotations, and so we really try to use not to use that word. There are alternatives to say like died by suicide, um, dying by suicide, etc. That are that that don't stigmatize people who have um, either um, made a suicide attempt or um, distress people who have lost people to suicide. So we really try not to use that, that word. And it just alludes to that fact that language is really important. It's really important that we think about the language you use, we use and the impact that that may have. And it also links to the whole culture thing as well. The difficulty naturally about us thinking about a campaign for the Global Mental Health Peer Network is that something that might work in South Africa won't work in Uganda, and, and something that might work in New Zealand won't work in Singapore. So it's about finding that common ground about, you know, concepts and language that, uh, that are global, you know, and that will work on a global platform. Mm. Mm. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. Bernard? Yeah, so uh, Marcel, really good question uh, that you raised. Uh, I just want to chip in with my thoughts. Um, it's quite interesting because uh, I have uh, two groups of circles. One group is made up of all guys and the other group is made up of all girls, all women. Right? So um, how I came about uh, to have this circle of male friends who talk about their struggles with mental health is interesting. Uh, so I've always been very open about my condition and, uh, you know, lots of people know about it. So when uh, male friends came to reach out to me, I noticed it's always one-to-one. -one. You know, they don't like to talk about it in a big group. So one friend came to me, uh, we had a good one-to-one -one chat, uh, and they were really curious, uh, you know, about how I managed to turn around my life. Uh, so it was a little bit solution-driven, I must admit. 
they were like, hey, you could do it. I could possibly do it, right? So that's their thinking. Uh, and then, uh, you know, another male friend came on, learned about it and wanted to meet. But what was really interesting was when I offered to have everyone meet up at the same time, it was a flat no. It was always one-to-one, -one, right? That was really interesting to me. Now, wow. the other circle of uh, friends, they are made up of females. Uh, again, uh, you know, because I've always been so open about it, uh, you know, and they came and reached out to me. And I, I noticed they were really comfortable reaching out in a group. You know, they just added on and the circle expanded. And that was, that was the difference for me, right? Uh, between having male and female thinking in terms of mental health. And when I extend that thought a little bit further onto technology space, it's even more interesting because uh, on Cara we have a um, a uh, news feed, not not news feed, but maybe like a community feed, where people are free to post their thoughts or questions about mental health anonymously. Um, over there, we have the statistics to show that uh, female making those posts make up about eighty percent. They were asking questions, getting involved, you know, whereas uh, males were like 20% involvement. Um, whereas if we compare uh, chat one-to-one -one on Kara, it's a 50-50 split, right? So that's really interesting for me um, from a technology point of view. Yeah. Well, Marcel, did, those, did they answer your question? Yes, they did. Um, and I'll ex and the reason I actually asked that is because I've experienced that personally. Um, I have never felt comfortable, uh, well, I never used to, getting into a group and um, having a, a sort of group therapy session uh, regarding my mood disorder. But yeah. when I sit down with a therapist, when I sit down with my partner, when I sit down with a friend, I can go on for hours and we can really bond. But when I got together in a group, I, I feel like I couldn't connect um, with, with people. Um, I felt like there was too much diversity. Nobody would be able to understand me um, because nobody would listen to me. Um, and these are the things that run around in my head. Uh, Sean, maybe it's part of the spiraling, um, but it would be like, oh no, if there's 20 of us here, how can everybody possibly have enough time to listen to me or to listen to them? Or what is that one going to, why is that one looking at me like that when I say this? Um, so I never felt comfortable. So I would prefer to be one-on-one -on -one where the other person knew me intimately, never a stranger, somebody who knew me intimately. And I always knew what their response would be to what I would share with them. So it's, it's, it's almost like I did a lot of research on who I would actually yeah. see. Yeah. So I, I can understand. I can understand uh, why Bernard is probably seeing those type of, of dynamics going on. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I, that's definitely something we want to we wanna change. Um, the thing is, we're never going to, it's never going to be a one size fits all approach. Um, that that's the reality, but if we can, you know, fine tune it as much as possible to cater for these kinds of things. And I think my question out to you guys before we end, um, and this can be, um, Tavanya, you can chip in as well if you've got an idea. Um, but say we were to organize, like Marcel, you were saying, let's let's have a group chat. Would it be better? Would it make it better, or would it make it? worse if you had a female lead the conversation so we go to a, a room there's 10 of us nine are males and one woman and she's saying okay this is let's just use me as an example and we're saying he has our peer support let's chat would that make it worse or would that make it better because women are easier with emotions um i'm just trying to figure that out for future for our future you know campaigning and stuff or should it be purely driven by men um yeah, I think that would be my question. If any of you could chip in and give you two cents on that. Sure, Bernard. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I think having a guy, a male to drive that whole thing would be good. Um, okay. The obvious reason would be for a group of guys sitting there with um, 
struggles with their mental health, to see someone lead their recovery and as a male, I think it's it's quite a visual example that, hey, this guy could do it. Maybe I could have okay. a shot, right? Yeah, so so that could be one way. Uh, but of course, it depends on, uh, you know, who this facilitator is uh, with the required skills, et cetera, and experience, of course. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay, noted. Yeah. Let's see. Anyone, Tiv, have an idea? Sean? Okay. Sean? I was just I was just going to say quickly, I've had really good male therapists and really poor male therapists, and I've had really good female therapists and really poor female therapists. Yeah. Some, yeah. some who have actually felt that they have shared more of their problems and issues with me than I've had an opportunity to share with them. So I came away feeling more burdened rather than less burdened. So, okay. so yeah. I'm, I'm not sure it's as simple as just a gender issue. But what I would say is one of the most powerful advocates in New Zealand, mental health advocates, is a gentleman who's an all black. Now, even people that don't know much about New Zealand know about the all blacks the all-black yeah. rugby team. And yeah. actually, with an all-black coming out and saying, I've experienced depression and it was really hard for me. And even somebody in my privileged position experienced it. And um, this is what worked for me. Because they're seen as the pinnacle of macho, strong New Zealand male, then mm. that was really, really helpful to move things on in this country. You know, so I'm just thinking if somebody from the South African Springboks would be willing to talk about their emotional vulnerability, what a huge oh. difference that may make, you know. Valid point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's something to consider, Marcel. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer um, because there is no one answer. Um, and the reason is it all depends on your audience. Um, it depends who you've got in that room. If, um, if you have a room full of conservative males, it's not a good idea to have a female leading the therapy session. Yeah. Uh, but if you have a, a room full of liberal males, then a female leading the session is fine. So I think that's why it becomes a difficult question because mm. it depends on the audience that you have there. Um, because the audience bring in their social and their cultural upbringing. We, we, we go yeah. back to that. We yeah. go back to that. And um, the audience will not necessarily, especially I think in a mental health setting, um, just see the, uh, the counselor, the, the psychologist as a gender neutral um, expert in that setting. Mm. They need to, in that situation, they need to relate to, to the, the counselor as a person. So there will be sort of uh, this bringing in of culture. So you might have males saying, oh no, there's a woman uh, leading this. I can't tell her too much about my problem because I don't, I want her to think I'm still a man and they'll yeah. hold back. Then you'll get another man who wants to share, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it, it really depends on your audience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's true. Um, something to think about. Tiv, do you want to add anything? I think the most important thing for me is that you can't change or address what you don't acknowledge. And a lot of people are sitting with this idea that something is not okay, but don't have the awareness or don't have the terminology to describe it. And because depression is, it comes with such a stigma attached to it, people don't want to attach that label to whatever it is that they're feeling. And that is where they try to suppress it. So if you talk about people in positions of power, I think it starts with taking a, a long, hard look inward, getting really honest with yourself first and uh, you know, coming to the realization that something is not okay. And it's only when you bring that darkness, so to speak, into the light, can you actually deal with it and address it. So I think that that has to happen before anything else has to happen. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think this um, this really, oh, I was seeing another language at the bottom of my screen and I was like, what is that? <laughs> um, 
so I think we need to look at um, going a step even further back before even looking at peer support and looking at how do we approach this. So perhaps Bernard, that you can also help with. But this is this has definitely been a very um, insightful conversation, and I want to thank all of you for coming out here and telling your stories and you know sharing your knowledge about you know what you've gained post your experience and during your recovery. So we're grateful that you were able to tell us um, your stories and, and give us some ideas of what to think about. Um, so on behalf of the Peer Network, thank you guys. It's really been a, a, a really nice session. Um, and I just wanna see if we have, I don't think we have any more comments from, um, yeah, from the audience as such, but we're gonna share this link again via our social. So, um, that will be shared and we can kind of take it from there and see what conversations we can carry on with and how we can take this forward and perhaps creating a subcommittee now with the peer network for men's mental health and perhaps you guys could also be keen on joining that um, and running with some campaign ideas. Um, but again, we need to go back to basics to see who's our audience, who's comfortable with what and um, we need to be adaptable to the different people and the different circumstances and culture that everybody's coming from. Um, but once again, thank you so much. And um, it was really lovely to hear all your stories. And I'm, I'm, I know I was the lead in this conversation, but I hope I was okay and <laughs> didn't make you guys sort of doubt the, the topic in the conversation. But thank you so much. Um, if there's any last words you guys would like to add before we close. I can just talk about the Maori language that I just posted. So, kai roto e te korero he rongoa, ke roto e te reo te rongoa he miri miri mō te hinangaro mō te wairua. So that um, the, it's never a direct translation in te reo Maori to English, but the, the, the transliteration is talking as a healing for the mind and spirit. And um, it was said by Mo Milne, who has been a great um, advocate for um, health, not just mental health, in um, Maori communities in New Zealand. So, um, yeah, I just thought I would share that because in um, Maori culture, we kind of close off um, uh, these sensitive conversations um, with a thing called a karakia, which sometimes is a prayer, but sometimes it's a saying and it's just a way of realizing that we've all opened ourselves up. And so so that we are protected, then we close ourselves again at the end of the sharing. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's so nice. Um, anyone else want to end off with something? I just want to say thank you to everyone. I think it's absolutely remarkable that we have such a courageous group of people willing to share their stories. I think it is so restorative. It is so healing. I think learning for me is ongoing. I've, I've taken away so many different things from here. So thank mm. you guys very much. It was a real honor to co-host this conversation with you. Thank you. Sure. Cool. And thank you to our attendees. Um, I see there's a couple of thank you messages. So we also thank you for joining. Um, Bernard, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, I just want to express my thanks for uh, this invite to speak about men's health. I think it's, it's really important. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of things we can do. And that's the exciting part, right? As a global peer network, we have so much we can do. Our roots are all over the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And to, to come up with a campaign an initiative and advocate men's health, I think it is hugely exciting to me, you know, yeah. and I can't wait to do more in this space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah likewise. Thank you. Marcel, last words? Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much. And thank you to all the participants that joined and, and shared so much of themselves. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Um, so we'll post this shortly on our social networks and you're more than welcome to share it so once again thank you for everything we appreciate it and let's hope this conversation can be put into action thank you very much take care guys bye <laughs>